Praise the Lord. God bless you and thank you once again for tuning in as we study the Word of God together. And if you join us for the first time, welcome to part six of our Triumphant Faith series. But before we start, let's pray. Um, today is Remembrance Sunday, the day we celebrate our fallen heroes. So let's just bow our heads and just thank God for those who gave their lives because the peace that we're enjoying today in the West is because of those who gave their lives at the war front. Father God, we thank you and praise you for blessing us with a new day. We thank you for the peace that we enjoy in the West. We thank you, Lord, as we remember our fallen heroes, O oh God, who gave their lives so that we can enjoy the peace we have today. Father, we ask that you will bless their families, O oh God. And Lord, we ask for your mercy. For Lord, you have blessed us with peace. Uh, you've, you've blessed us with so many things. But Lord, we have forgotten you. We have departed from your word. But Father, great is your mercy. In your wrath, remember mercy, O oh Lord. And, and Lord, we thank you, O oh Lord, for, for Jesus. We thank you, O oh God, because it's by his death, his bloody death on the cross that we have peace in him and father we are grateful that we can have peace not the, the peace that the world gives but the peace that comes from our relationship with you through jesus christ and we thank you for that and father we come to worship you this morning we come to to receive from you for you are the bread of life Father, we pray that your word will minister grace to us. That, Lord, as many as are listening today, Lord, they will, be, they will receive a word of healing, a word of comfort, a word of encouragement. That, Lord, your word is living and powerful. That your word will remove any ungodliness, anything that is on Christ in us, O oh Lord. Yes, Father, we pray that you fulfill your purpose in our lives. That, Lord, you will perfect that which concerns us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you for tuning in. And, and um, I'm sure God is going to, you know, refresh us. The Bible says his message are new every morning. And I'm excited today because I'm sure we're going to be blessed. You know, we live in difficult times. And um, the Bible says things are not going to get better things will get wor worse the bible says in the last days iniquity will abound wickedness will be ra rampant wickedness will multiply in the world A and hence the reason for this study on faith because the only way we, we will overcome the challenges that are coming fast you know as we see in our work today due to the covid pandemic that there's been a loss of life, loss of job, uncertainty, fear, anxiety, you know. A lot of people are going through tough times. The nations are going through tough times. Economies of the world are going through tough times. And the only way we can survive is through faith. Because this is what the Bible says. This is what God says to us. You know, God has made a provision. God has not abandoned us. He said, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the challenges of this world and this is the victory that overcomes the world our faith hallelujah that even in times of famine and hardship god is promised to be with us that we will be satisfied and and that's the reason uh, of this study because this is the time we need to grow in faith because it's either we're growing in faith or growing in fear fear and faith cannot coexist in us it's either you have fear of faith. So and I hope um, these messages will build us up in our faith because it's faith that overcomes. So at the moment, we're talking about how to grow our faith, different ways to grow our faith. Um, we've talked about um, prayer. You know, prayer is paramount in growing our faith. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 46, verse 10, Be still and know that I'm God. The only way we can see the power of God manifesting in our lives. The, the only way we can see the glory of God, you know, manifest, the only way we can see God working in our lives is when we become still, you know, that is when we make time, 
you know, to commune with God, to talk with God. You know, uh, um, Christianity is not about religious activities, it's about relationship with God, having a one-to-one -one with God, having a quiet time with God. Uh, we, 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 we learned about examples of Joseph and King David, how they sought God in their troubles and they received that realm of word of faith, you know, and they, they achieved victory. So we also talked about knowing your Bible as well. Uh, it's also a means of growing in faith. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, you know. That is knowing our Bible from Genesis to Revelation, not just picking parts of the Bible. That means as a serious student or, or, of God, of the Holy Spirit, you need to, to um, devise a plan to read the whole Bible in a year because it's the Word of God. Genesis is to Revelation is inspired by God. It's our duty as believers to make sure we read what God has given to us. Amen. So we're not only we, we learn that we're not only to read the Bible, we are, we are, we're also meant to meditate, to think about what we've read. And also we also call to memorize the Bible. That is to hide God's word in our heart. It's used to just carrying your Bible in your hand or your, your electronic tablet if you're not reading, if it's not in your heart. Because then the Holy Spirit will be able to engage with you. Yet the word of God in your heart becomes the sword of the Spirit. And also we are called to be students. God says, study yourself approved. That is, as a serious believer, you need to know the doctrines, the teachings of the Bible. You need to know why you believe, what you believe. You need to know what the Bible talks about marriage, what the Bible talks about sexuality, what the Bible talks about family life. You know, you need to, what the Bible talks about giving or the Holy Spirit. Or else you'll be deceived. You see, the, it's a, so the, 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 the Christianity is not wishy washy. We have something that we stand upon. The Bible called the foundation of truth. Amen. So the Christianity is defined, okay? It's not built on feelings or sentiments, or else we'll all be um, confused. But today, we're going to talk about another way to grow our faith, and that is what I call obedience. Obedience. Obedience is very essential. To the growth of our faith it is not enough to eat we have to exercise our bodies to be fit and healthy the purpose of eating is not only for enjoyment or pleasure but to get energy and strength to serve the god above us and the people around us so obedience is exercising our faith in response to hearing god's word we are not meant only to read our Bible, sit down in church and just soak it in. You know, we are meant to put into practice what we have heard, what we've read. And that is the way we will grow our faith. Let's look at what Apostle James says about this. If you got your Bibles with you, if you open with me to James chapter 1, verse 22 to 26, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, Be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks, now listen to this, this is the key point, verse 25. But he who looks into the perfect lovely, but that is the word of God. That is, you need to read the word of God, yeah? And continues do you hear that that is you don't say well well i've read the bible i know all about it the bible says we need to continue day by day because the, the bible is the bread of life it's the word of god for our spirit you know you can't say well because i've eaten this food i've eaten pasta this week and rice or whatever your staple food is you know and bread i'm not going to eat it next week oh i've tasted this food before i i know all about it you starve to death you know the word of god is, is meant to be read every day. And it says, and not a forgetful hearer. What does that say? It says we need to memorize and meditate on the word of God. But a doer of the work, this one will be blessed. So you're not blessed if you just look at the Bible once. You, you know, you're not consistent in daily reading the Bible. You don't memorize. If they tell you to what verse you know in the Bible, do you know a verse? You know, we should be able to 
you know, even though we might not know chapter and verse, but to have the word of God in your heart. And verse 26 says, if anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, you know, he deceives himself. What does that mean? That is, you see, um, your tongue reveals who you are. That is, you may have religion, you may be spiritual, but lack morals. Religion without morality is useless. Okay? So, and one thing we have to learn, one important thing is that faith does not relate only to receiving healing or miracles or financial breakthrough. Faith is obeying the word of God. Okay? Uh, let's take an example in First Samuel um, um, chapter 15, verse 22 to 23. We all know the story of Saul and Samuel. And but Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice. And submission is better than offering the father of rams. So what's God saying here? He's saying that you know you may fast, you may pray, you know, uh, you may you may even pay tithes or give above. But you are living in sin. You, you, you know, you, you are not obeying the word of God. It's useless, God says, because obedience is better than sacrifice. You know, this guy, King Saul, you know, was told to do something, but he, he, he did it partially. Partial, partial obedience to disobedience. So, uh, and he brought some of the sacrifices to God, but God says, no, you know, I, I'm not interested. It's like, a man who cheats on his wife and you buy your wife jewelry and think will that satisfy her and say oh at least uh, this is cost a lot of money you know you, you know no 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 your affection is meant for me alone okay so faith is obeying god okay even uh, faith is obeying the word of god even if we don't understand it even if it doesn't make sense to us you know it's it, it, it's that's faith obeying God. For example, what do we mean? God says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. You know, bless and don't curse your enemies. Pray for those who hurt you. You know, it doesn't make sense to, to the natural man. You know, you say, well, how can I pray for my employer who abuses me, who's not paying me very well? Who, how can I pray for my nasty boss? How can I pray for my on, uh, 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 on, uh, on, uh, um, my husband that doesn't understand me? Or how can I pray for that ash person? How can I pray for my, you know, for my governor, or for my um, president? You know, it's just missing it all over the place. But God says, pray for your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those in authority. You know, whether they are bad or good, it's not that's not our business. So, so I don't understand it. But God says, love your enemies. You mean love my enemies? No, I want them to die instead. But God's words say, love your enemies. So, faith is obeying God, okay? Because you might speak in tongues fast and yet you are hating your enemy, you have malice in your growth, then you, you cannot grow in your faith. That is, we are meant to obey the word of God, even if our societies or culture goes against or does not agree with what we believe. You know, for, for example, premarital sex fornication is okay with our culture today. 90, almost 90, over 90% 90 of what is shown, shown on TV, you know, uh, promotes fornication, promotes premarital sex, promotes illicit sex. But the Bible says, you know, sex is meant for marriage. So we need to obey the word of God, okay? Because God says so. And because what God says is wrong 4,000 years ago, is still wrong today. And it cannot be wrong in the future. Forever his word is certain and God does not change. So what does God tell us to do when we read scriptures? Okay. Because the Holy Spirit speaks to us through the scriptures. What does he tell us to do? Anyway, one thing we have to realize is before we read scriptures, it is very important that we pray first. Okay. You know, this is... For example, this is a prayer of David that we, I'm sure some of you do pray, but if you are new to this, uh, if you open your Bible, it says um, 119 verse 18. You know, David said, open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instructions. 
Just like before you eat, it is good to give thanks to God. Because the food you are eating is not by your power, your mind. You know, you may be sitting in your house, have you know, comfortable, you know, we need to we need to pray because it's not by your power, because there are people who are professors, who are graduates, who, you know, um, you know, who are intelligent but are hungry. Why? Because not of, not because of their fault, because maybe the country their country goes um, goes into a war or a tribal war or civil war and then uh, and Unfortunately, they lose their jobs. There are no jobs to go to. Uh, even the, uh, even now, the, the, uh, the COVID situation, a lot of companies have closed down, you know, and people are struggling. So whenever you have food before you, be grateful, be thankful. So when we come before the Word of God, which is the bread of life, you say, Lord, thank you. Open my eyes. That might be a wondrous thing. Sort of. So why do we pray? Why do we have to pray? Because it's the Spirit that gives life to his word. John 6, chapter 63. Okay? A New King James Version. He said, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. You know, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and life. You see, the word of God is living and powerful. The word of God is alive. The word of God is spiritual. The word of God is not like any other book. The word of God is not Shakespeare. It's not the novels, Milton Boone, you know, um, magazines historical books political science books science books the word of god is alive and it is spiritual descent so we you can't understand it with your head knowledge a lot of people that have head knowledge have accumulation of knowledge but they don't have the spirit because it's the spirit that gives us understanding so when we come before the bible it's a magical book that is unlocked by the holy spirit that's what the bible says in first corinthians 2 14 it says the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit, that's New King James Version, for there is foolishness to him. Nor can he know them. You see, he can't know them, you see, in, in, with human understanding, because they are spiritually discerned. The way to unlock the Bible is through the Holy Spirit, because he is the author of the Bible. You see, we have so many books in this world, in the world, or you have, you have many books in your library, um, but you don't have the author be, be, beside you. The Bible is the only book that you have the author of the book beside you. That is if you have Jesus in your life, you know, to teach you. That's what we need to pray. Lord, teach me. Okay. Now, this is a su suggested guideline to follow when reading God's Word in order to grow our faith. You know, so when you approach God's Word, this, uh, this is just a suggested guideline, you know, to help you. When you are praying, what God, when you pray, go open my eyes. Then you begin to see: Is there? You ask yourself this question. Maybe you read through a passage or reading through the passage in the Bible. If you know, you, uh, you remember, you need to have a plan to read the whole Bible. You know, yeah, not just the places you like. Okay, because every word is inspired by God from Genesis to Revelation. Even if you don't understand, just read through. Okay, God will, will show you what you need to understand. So first of all, when you read your when you're reading your Bible. You can ask yourself this question, okay? Is there a sin to avoid? Is there a sin that God is telling me to avoid? You know, the, the Word of God reveals to us sins we need to avoid. You know, the Word of God is like a mirror, like we read earlier. You know, that, you know, like when you go before the mirror in the morning, it shows you, uh, you know, you've got something in your eyes, on your nose, or you've got some speck in your, uh, in your, on, on your air, and, and you need to dust them off. So. So the word of God shows us what is wrong. That it shows us what we need to avoid. Let's look at some things that we need to avoid. Um, I, 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 avoid in life. Um, I, I think First Corinthians chapter six, um, reading New Living Translation, verse eight to eleven, you know, kind of shows us certain kind of sins we need to avoid. Okay, instead, you yourselves are the ones who wrong and cheat even your brother. You know, um, your your fellow believers. That is, God is saying. It's wrong to cheat your fellow believer, okay? If you are doing that, you need to stop. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourself. Those who indulge in sexual sin, that is, avoid sexual sin, okay? Worship idols, that is, that is when you put something else ahead of God. When something else consumes your passion, you know, your energy, you know, you, you know your time. Like maybe, for example, you're supposed to be in church, you're sleeping. That is self. You worship self. 
you know you decide to watch movies or, or or you go you party overnight you can't get up in the morning to go to church or maybe you're supposed to be in church there's a game on your your, your favorite team is playing uh, and you don't show up in church okay that means that becomes your god your worshiper of idols or you decide to do your chores at home or say well you know i've been working out um or working you know six six days a week i need to just chill out i need to do my catch up with my housework but who gave you the strength in the first place to go to work and enemy it's not god so um um we need to avoid worship m m uh, worship of idols idolatry and that's clear homosexuality or our uh, thieves greedy or drunkards or abusive even if you're abusive you know you're very abusive your mouth is sharp you know uh, you're quick to you know to, to abuse people it's wrong you know you need to avoid that cheat people none of this will inherit the kingdom of god is you know perhaps some of you were once like that is yes you know before we become christians we all indulge in various of those sins but now that you're a christian you know you are washed you, you need not to go back to your vomit and also we have to avoid sins like gossiping and sowing discord among um brothers or arguments you know proverbs six nineteen says a false witness pours out lies a person who sows discord in a family proverbs 26 20 26 20 says fire goes out without wood and quarrels disappear when gossip stops okay so is God the Holy Spirit speaking to you about some of the above sins? Yeah? If you do not repent of the sin, you will not grow in your faith. If you don't repent, you will not grow in your faith. Okay? Why? Because the Bible says the prayer of the wicked, you know, is an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 15 8 says, The Lord detest the sacrifice of the wicked the prayer of the wicked is an abomination to the lord you will not grow in your faith because god will not hear you you will not hear a word from god proverbs 28 9 say god detests the prayers of a person who ignores the law if you ignore the word of god if you refuse, you refuse to obey the word of god will ignore you as well god will detest your prayer the bible says in proverbs 28 13 he that covered his sins will not prosper you will not prosper you're not growing faith Okay, but he that confesses and forsakes them, forsakes them will have mercy. Amen. So, is there a sin to avoid? The next thing that you need to to maybe ask yourself is: Is there a promise to claim? Is there a promise to claim? It? You know, when you're reading through the Bible, you see the Bible has over seven thousand promises to hold us up in our challenge, especially in these last days. There are so many promises. In the Bible <clears throat> for example you see the Bible is the most practical book in the world you know it's living it tells about life events uh, it tells about it tells us about real people in real time in real places you know it, 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 there are challenges there you know the way that uh, their relationship with God the, uh, the obedience and disobedience and the consequences of obedience and disobedience and Let's take an example of a man called Jacob. Jacob was in dire straits. He was in trouble. And in Genesis chapter 32, um, uh, let's read from verse 9. We see, let's see what's happened to Jacob here. And Jacob, you know, in, remember, cheated his brother out of his birthright, which was actually his, but and he was afraid his brother was going to avenge and kill him. So in Genesis chapter 2 from verse 9, we read, Then Jacob prayed, O God of my grandfather, Abraham and God of my father Isaac. Oh Lord, you told me, return to your own land and to your relatives and you promised me. You see, Jacob is quoting the promise of God. He's rem reminding God of his promises to him. He said, you promised me I would treat you kindly. <clears throat> Verse 10. He said, I'm not worthy of all the unfailing love or I'm not worthy of the list of your mercies. Okay, you've shown to me your servant. When I left home and crossed the Jordan River, I owned nothing except, except a walking stick. Now my household feels too large cams. Oh Lord, please rescue me from the hand of my brother Esau. I am afraid that he's coming to attack me along with my wives and children. See, he was in trouble. 
and, and, and when we're in trouble or when we face challenges, you know, the first thing we need to do is to go to God. And he said, but you promised me, verse 12, I will surely treat you kindly. I will multiply your descendants until they become as numerous as the sands along the seashore to many to come. So we see that Jacob's, Jacob's prayer has God's promises, has God's word in it. And Jacob was quoting promises from Genesis 28 because God promised him earlier, you know, when he had this dream of angels, you know, <clears throat> ascending and descending up a ladder. And, and, and Genesis 28 verse 10, he says, On the top of the stair with stood the Lord and said, I am the Lord your God, the God of your father Abraham, Isaac. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. I am giving it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions, to the west, to the east, to the south. And all the families will be blessed to you. What's more, I am with you. I will protect you wherever you go. So, now you can see the, th those promises. And again, Genesis 31.3. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your father and grandfather and, and to your relatives, and I will be with you there. So, Jacob took God's promises back to him. Lord, this is what you said. Okay? Jacob knew God's promises. He knew that this is obtained by grace. He didn't just barge into God. say, God, this is mine. I claim this in Jesus' name. He said, Lord... I am unworthy of the list of his mercy. He knows that, you know, we are saved by grace. So that we can't boast. You can't just barge into God and say, God, I deserve this. I demand this. We need to come humbly, okay? Like Joseph had did. Joseph had to quote God's promises. Daniel too. Let's look at Daniel, another example of someone who, you know, claimed God's promises. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 1 to 5, we'll read. Um, I'll read from verse 2. He said, during the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned reading the word of the Lord. You see, this man, you know, read the word of God. And that's why it's important we read the word of God, you know. And do you have a plan to read the word of God today? Have you read? Maybe your, yours, you know, we all have different times. But do you have a plan of reading the word of God today? And he said, as I was reading the word of the Lord, I found it was revealed to Jeremiah the prophet that Jerusalem must be desolate for 70 years. So I turned to the Lord of God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. Okay? So I prayed to the Lord and confessed, O oh Lord, you are great and awesome. So, verse 5, I said, but we have sinned and done wrong. The reason I'm reading that is that he came humbly. We have to come humbly before God. You, you know, you don't come barging in and saying, Lord, I deserve this. Look at what I've done for you. Look at Daniel, great man of God. He said, I have sinned. Your people have sinned. You know, so he, he, he saw the promise of God that the, the captivity of God's people in Babylon will last for 70 years. And the time has, uh, 70 years has come. So he began to seek God in prayer. I said, God, this is what you say. This is what you promise. And we know that God was faithful. So how can we apply this to our lives today? That is, you see, as we read God's word, the Holy Spirit will lead us to claim a promise or promises that apply to our situation. I don't know what situation we're going through, but the, the truth is that every one of us, we go through challenging times. That's a fact if you're a believer. But, but because if you say you're a believer, you don't have trouble, you don't have trouble, that means maybe you are traveling on the same road with the devil. Because the Bible says every godly person, if you are truly godly, you face persecution, okay? So, when we read the scriptures, the Spirit of God will lead us to claim a promise or promises that apply to our situation. Then we take those promises to God in prayer. Like the Old Testament says, that we ask God in the name of Jesus. You know, some people are confused. Who do I pray for? Do, what do I pray to? Do I pray to God or do I pray to Jesus or do I pray to the Holy Spirit? Definitely, we pray to God. In the name of Jesus uh, because Jesus himself said in John 14 verse 14 ask for anything in my name and I will do it ask in my name okay well you say didn't mention in my father uh, uh, well let's look at John 16 23 that actually made it much clearer John 16 <coughs> verse 23 at that time he said you would need to ask for anything you need to ask me for anything I'll tell you the truth you will ask the Father directly and He will grant you your request because you use 
my name so jesus is saying we we go to god we ask god using his name we ask god in the name of jesus it's actually the bible like a big checkbook checkbook of promises and assurances for us believers if you're not a believer you, know, you don't have access to that checkbook so we take it we, we know we take our problem to god okay we take it to jesus we take our check we take it through jesus because on every check the owner of the check the name of the owner of the check is written on the check and the owner of the check needs to sign his name so we take it to jesus to sign it or to agree with what we uh, to agree that what we want is in in line with this way because when we pray in the name of jesus it's not like a magic wand you know, it's not kind of, it's not that it's not Aladdin's lamp that you rub, uh, or you know, it's not a one in Jesus' name. In you know, it means it has to be in accordance to His will. See, because many of us ask things today which is not in line. We, put, we might put the name of Jesus, but Jesus is not signing the check because it's not accordance to it. So, where is that in the Bible? In James chapter four, verse two, we got your Bible. It's very important. He said, "You want." New Living Translation said, You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. You don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. You see, James is agreeing what we're saying that we need to ask God for it in the name of Jesus. Okay, so if you don't ask, you don't get. So if you don't pray, you don't get. Okay, but even when you ask, you, in, in, he said, you ask so that you can consume it on your loss. Okay? You don't have what you want because you don't ask for God. But And also you ask it because it's, it's for pleasure sake. So, God will not definitely will not answer anyone whose main, whose main um, objective is is to is for pleasure you know we all have earthly parents you won't give your child everything they ask for because you love them because you might harm them you might hurt them they're not yet mature to get it so god will not give you anything that is not in accordance to his will but when we ask according to his will definitely you know jesus signs the check we take it to the father and it's guaranteed you know because in first john chapter 5 14 to 15 we read and we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask anything that pleases him so if you ask something that doesn't please god he's not going to give it to you in the name you know because he's not going to put his signature in, in, in signature to it but if we ask what pleases him guess what happens we know he hears us when we make our request we also know that he will give us what we ask for okay so there are many promises in the bible that we can you know claim that we can take it to jesus in prayer remember what we said you don't go barging into god's presence or demanding or claim you know you come humbly like the saints that we like like jacob like daniel they went to god with the promise of god said lord be merciful i'm not worthy you know this is what you said in your word have mercy upon me look upon your servant i come not in my own name i come in the name of jesus i come in the righteousness of christ please have mercy show me favor oh lord so there are promises in the bible like for example philippians 4 19 the promise of provision most of us we know this verse and the same god who takes care of me will supply all your needs oh my god will supply all my needs according to his riches in glory so it's not just it's not just about just quoting this words like a parrot, okay? So oh my God, my God, you go to God in prayer and seek God. God, I'm going through this difficult situation. I I I am struggling with with finance. Lord, you promised me that you supply all my needs. You know Psalm 23 verse one also. The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. You know the, uh, in the New Living Translation it says. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. I go to God. God, you know, you are my father. You said you would take care of me. You know, I, you know, help me. I need this. I need this, Lord. I'm struggling here. My, I'm, uh, my shoes is getting worn. Um, uh, my clothes is getting worn. Um, you know, God cares about our needs because he said, ask to the, each, uh, each day for daily bread. So it's God's desire to meet our needs as we come to him in faith and in humility. 
There's also promise of protection and you know and blessing. First um, Chronicles chapter four verse ten. The Bible says uh, there was a man he who prayed to the God of Israel, Jabez. He said, "Oh, that you would bless me and expand my ter territory or enlarge my coast. Please be with me in all that I do. Keep me from all trouble and pain." And God, God granted him his request. So the Bible put it, this story there for a reason, for us, so that like Jabez. The Bible said, this is the man who prayed. How do they know he prayed? Not, that means it's not, he didn't just pray once. They observed that this guy, wow, he's always going to the temple. He's always seeking God. His, his mind is always focused on God. It's not just kind of half-hearted prayers, like you pray and you forget all about it. You know, he was consistent. And, and he said, Lord, enlarge my territory. You know, and he's asking for the glory of God, not just for his own pleasure to show off, to oppress others. To say, look at me, see I've arrived now. You know, my enemy, look at me, I've arrived. No, it's for the glory of God. So that he also can be a blessing. See, his testimony is a blessing to us today. So we can come to God with his promises. Our Lord, enlarge me. So I can be a blessing to the kingdom of God. And a, and a blessing to my brothers and sister, sisters in need. There's another, um, you know, promise in Second Timothy 4.18. Yes, that the Lord will deliver me from every evil work or evil attack and will bring me slavery into his heavenly kingdom. All glory to God forever and ever. That's another promise I can take to God. The Lord will deliver me from every evil work. I go to God. Oh Lord, I thank and I praise you. Yes, you are the God in heaven and earth. Oh yes, deliver me according to your promise. You deliver me from every evil work, every evil plan. Yes, you know, I will not disappoint you, O Lord. Satan will not you know, um, will not defeat me. I will not fall into sin. I will live for you. I will, every plan of Satan to to cut me down, to 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 disgrace me, will not will not be fulfilled in Jesus' name. The Lord will deliver from every evil plan from my enemies, and Lord will, will preserve me safely into His heavenly kingdom. And I also promises of healing as well. Let's look at Matthew 8, 8, 16 to 17. That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. He cast out evil spirits with a simple command, and he healed all the sick. This fulfilled what the Lord, word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah said, that he took our sicknesses and removed our diseases. He carried our sorrows. Hallelujah. He was wounded for our trans. He was bruised for iniquities. By his stripes we are healed. First Peter twenty four. So we can take this to God humbly. I say, Lord, oh, remember me. You know, Lord, this is what you said. Because on the cross you took my pain, you took my sickness and disease, and by your stripes I'm healed. And we thank God that God is still in the healing business. Hallelujah. God is still. We see here God's. Is there's the testimonies of people delivered and healed but also there's a promise promise of grace if the problem of physical affliction is not taken away if you know you don't receive your healing there's promise of grace now we see this again in second corinthians chapter 12 7 to 10 second corinthians chapter 12 7 to 10 and this is Paul's testimony. He said, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a tongue in my flesh, a messenger from sin to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. So, you see, whatever situation we have, nobody knows exactly what the tongue of this flesh is. You know, people have different views of But thank God. So, God did not give a uh, give for a reason so that each one of us can you know uh, uh, apply ourselves to this verse that whatever your tone is whatever the tone in your side is whatever challenge or problem physical problem spiritual problem health problem emotional problem you can apply to it he said and we can take it to God he said I took it to God three times I begged the Lord to take it away but each time he said, 
my grace is all you need or my grace is sufficient for you my power works best in weakness so now i am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of christ can walk through me so that's why i take pleasure in my weaknesses and insults and hardships Oh, this man faced insults or harsh persecutions, troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. Amen. So, what are, we, what are we to learn from here? You know, he said, Paul said, God allowed this for a reason. He allowed it because he doesn't want me to be proud, to keep me from becoming proud. You see, we don't know the reason where some are not healed. You know, and we cannot put judgment because not everybody is healed in the Christian world. We have to realize that you have to have a balanced view, a balanced view, uh, of, of, uh, which is uh, from the Word of God. And not everybody is healed. Some are healed, but some are not. But in this case, we, we, we can only learn from the example of Paul that he said his own personal reason was because was to keep him from being proud. Okay, let's just read that again. So, um, in case you want to write that down, he said. Um, verse 7, even though I received such wonderful relations, so to keep me from becoming proud. So we don't know, we, you don't know. Maybe for some of us, God is keeping you in that difficult situation, in that difficult job, to humble you, to prepare you, whatever it might be, whatever situation you might be facing. Maybe to keep you from destroying yourself, maybe to keep you from um, destroying your marriage or your health or, or uh, keeping you out of trouble. We don't know, um, you know, unless you are someone who has a deep relationship with God like Paul and God tell you, you know, he's to keep you from, but some of us do know. I know sometimes, what, you know, I'm in a situation because God you know, and I know my personally that, that God has a reason and I give God the glory. God knows what is best for us and he keeps us in a place for his own reason. And so, so he says to us, my grace is sufficient for you. And the question is, do you have faith not to be healed? Um, the will you still praise God when you are not healed? That's the key. Like Job, will you still praise God? He said, "Though you slay me, I will trust you." When you don't get, when you don't get your way, when things don't fall into place for you, will you still praise God, or will you, you know, um, be upset? Will you turn your back on God? You know, will you forsake God? Let's take another promise. Um, um, and, uh, okay, uh, we're running out of time here. Promise, promises of care. We round up. Promises of care and assurance, Isaiah 41 10. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Uh, why is God saying this? God is speaking to someone in a situation. The problem is not gone away. So he's saying to the person, Don't be discouraged. Being with you should be suffering. I'm your God. I will strengthen you in that situation. I will help you. I will I will take you to it. Isaiah 46, 3 to 4 says. You know, I've made you, I will look after you. You know, yes, I'll carry you, I carried you before you were born. I will be your God throughout your lifetime, even to your gray ears, I will look after you. So these are promises to hold us up that we can take to God. You know, and we can remind God all the time. Psalm 119, verse 49 says, David prayed, Remember your promise to me, it's my only hope. So I guess we'll close here and then we continue on the next, uh, the second part of obedience. So I believe and I hope you've been blessed and encouraged through this. That as you read your Bible, you know, it, you, it, it, you le you've learned today that obedience does not, um, or faith does not relate only to receiving healing or miracles, but faith is obeying the word of God. And, and you, mu you must, you know, as you read the word, God obeys word. God does not joke with his, joke with his word. Okay? So, um, God bless you um, for watching. And one thing I always say is to share this message. It's more like an electronic leaflet that you share so that people can be saved. As most of us today, we live on social media, the world, most people live on that, Twitter, things like that. So, I just want to encourage you to share this message so that someone else could be blessed. But before I go, I just want to pray for someone who do not know Jesus Christ and um, who God is speaking to, God, the Spirit is nudging your heart. Father, I just pray for this one. And if you have that one, you want to give your life to Christ, say, just repeat this after me. Heavenly Father, oh Lord, I thank you for your love for me. 
Father, today I humble myself. Father, I give up, you know, running away, postponing my salvation. Today I give you my life. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I, I confess him as my Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray, give me the grace to, to live for you and honor you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that, then welcome to God's kingdom. Remember, read your Bible, make time with God, and um, obey the word of God. So God bless you for watching. If you miss any of our messages, you can always watch it online at Noah's Ark Sanctuary Church and subscribe. So um, God bless you till we'll meet again and have a great day. God bless you.